that we're live again with Horseshoe and Helga. Are we going live now? Yeah. All right. The first thing that everybody wanted to talk about, I figured we could get it all in the in the same group. Is one is welding aluminum, toe bends, and tong position, and you know the way that we have to use an actual. Uh, cell phone to use the camera the camera quality is not that good so what I was gonna do is use aluminum I thought it would show up a little bit better and the thing about a toe bend is that when people use make a toe bend their tongue positioning if you have this is where our center punch mark is if your tongs are here and you're there on the horn your toe bend is going to be we're back in my shop we don't get that good a connection I don't have Wi-Fi out here so whatever you got or you didn't get we're gonna we're gonna go back and we're gonna the horn is one of the the spots the fulcrum and the tongs so you have basically if you have the tongs further from the end than the horn is then it'll move your center because the way the steel bends always find center so if you can see this you can move one you can move one finger in and the other one it'll always catch up with the other one and it'll always let your fingers meet up with each other dead center so like you can watch once you get more weight on one side it just it automatically grabs until you go right to the center and that's the way a toe bend works you always want to have your tongs positioned on the bar stock to where they're going to go against the inertia. So if I'm going to hit here, if I'm perfectly straight, what that's going to do is pull the tongs out of my hand and, and I'll, I'll lose all leverage points. So whenever I'm going to start my toe bend, I want to have my tongs be slightly more than 90 because I'm going to literally push up to where I can get my toe bend. If I just go, if I go straight or if I'm like this, they'll lose all holding power. So we'll get it hot and do that right now. A fire. The best way to work two shoes and work in the fire is first is you don't need a raging fire. You don't need a big fire. You need a little gopher mound. You need to have a horseshoe hole and you need to have enough to where the coke falls in. The second that you have so much coke that the least amount of air can't go straight out you lose the focus of your fire and then it just turns into a big rager and you don't know where the center of your fire is as soon as like you're the center of my fire Greg. <laughs> all right then you take a hammer handle and you are just going to go ahead we got not enough heat we're just going to keep up keep it in there until it burns the wood once it burns the wood then we'll it will have plenty of heat that's how you get that special finesse grade into the decorating light. Yes, it is. Oh my god, that's so hot. Like a fire. Oh, so there's, there's um, Joe Nyfren says hi. Hi, Joe. I miss you. All right, there we go. We're almost there. Once we get her to the core temperature, then you don't have to stick it in there for as long because it's already gonna be a little bit hot. But right now we're just getting a nice, good temperature on it. Cause it's getting hot in here. <laughs> there we go. We are set up. All right, so we'll come back. We're gonna run down here and we're just slightly tapping and I'm gonna come up here. I'm not, and just keep on, you don't wanna keep on hitting in the same spot. When you hit in the same spot, you create a kink. So now, I'm gonna start out here, and I'm gonna push down with my tong hand at the same time. Start out here, and I'm gonna push down. I never hit horn on hammer and hammer on horn. And you can see, I never once made contact and pinched. 
The reason that you don't want to start right here and hit is because if I get a reverse loop, it tightens my toe and there is strength and shape. And the strength and the shape is, as soon as it's got a reverse arc, when you hit here, it'll literally make your toe even tighter. So when I, I want to have all my energy going around the outside. So the big Irish guy's on here, Craig, his name's Ian Ritchie. Oh my gosh, Ian. Is it, he looks like the, he just looks like the guy from the Lucky Charms commercial. Exactly. <laughs> they're just like the Irish, only they're Oh not. yeah, the Scottish, you mean. <laughs> yeah. Those dress wearing freaks. All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a hockey stick. And, and the hockey stick, Look at my tongs. They're going to be going the as exact opposite direction as the inertia with my hit. If I have my tongs like this, it's going to flop it out of my hands. <laughs> He's been flopped. So right now I'm going to keep my tongs here. I'm going to keep my hockey stick above parallel to the ground and I'm going to hit. It's going to look like I'm pinching against the horn, but I'm going to be right off the horn. So Travis, Travis Buck is here. I wonder if he has a deer. <laughs> <laughs> And his father. I wonder if he has a big dough. Ah, ah, I cracked myself up. All right, so we got, again, you can see the center of my fire. Not that big. I already burned it. Man, it was hot. Hold on. Just like you're burning this. No, nope, I burned it. Seat, right? I got it too hot. I got it too far down in there. Just give it a second. That means more of my hockey stick's gonna be on one side than the other. All right. Yeah, I got her pretty hot there. That only took a second. If you're patient and you don't hit it, you won't do that much damage. We're gonna try and salvage this because it's not a big deal. Wake up, you fans on here. I right. love that guy. There we go. All right, so now, I don't know, I'm not gonna trust it just yet. Steve Whitehall? All right. You are only a customized sexy ass keep boy. Keep it, keep it, keep it above parallel. There we go. Bring it down. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull and I'm gonna push. I'm gonna aim towards my feet and I'm gonna pull. There we go. Come here and I'm just gonna get a little bit more bend. Don't, don't pinch it. Don't pinch it on the horn. And it was fortunate that it was a hockey stick because I can just upset that burnt material on the end. So now, I'm gonna have a slight gap. You can see a slight gap in there. I'm gonna hold it at an angle, hit this corner, crisping it up. This corner, crisping it up. Mark is wise on you. He's pretty smart. All right. <laughs> you can see I've got plenty of material. Just come here and let it sit over the edge ever so slightly. There we go. There we go. And again, create a, a gap and get that tip flat across the back. Now that I got a hot fire, I'm just gonna get a little bit of heat on the branch. Not as much as I did before. Well, maybe you should help us then as a WCD guy. All right, so now, Look at my tongs. I'm gonna be pulling this way with my hammer so my tongs gotta be the reverse. They're pushing under. I'm gonna find where the gap is. I'm just gonna be right off the anvil. I'm not gonna pinch hammer against horn. I'm gonna be right off the gap and feed it underneath. All right. One side done. And I'll do the same to the other side.
Can they see that? Can you guys see that out there? Are we not on? We got it burned just enough. Above, parallel to the ground, keep it there. You look at my tongs. And then. If I let it get like this, it kinks and it puts a big buckle right here. So I'm gonna keep it. Above, there. Again, you gotta be pushing down. If you let it get up, your tongs get up, and as you notice, my tongs are so that they're facing towards the face of the anvil. Hold. There we go. You can feel it lock in. Flatten it up really nice. Have a little bit of a gap, and hold it at an angle. Make you a nice straight line, hold it at an angle. What that does is it doesn't pinch material, material, but it does make a line for you. All right. And we'll scarf it. When rolling aluminum does a paper scarf benefit more than a step? Yeah, well, what, what we're gonna do is, that, that's a good question. When you're welding aluminum, we're actually brazing, we're not welding. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make this weld look just like whenever we are brazing. So it's gonna look completely done with no flux. So now I'll get my wire brush and I'm gonna clean all the dirt and debris off of both sides of the scarf because this is what needs to be cleaned up. I've lost my heat, so I'm just gonna take a little bit of heat to get my, my other branch pulled together. Wait and hurry to ask, how old are you, Craig? 51. What's that got to do with anything, huh? I have no idea. Helga got kicked off the air. Wait, they, did they say she can't be on there? Uh, our, our other WCB administrator said so. Alright, All right. got a little, little bit of heat. Now watch. Way to hurt is trying to get in your pants. It's still good, not looking good. Alright, so right now, I'm going to push with my tongs and push it down. And I'm going to hit right where it's a uh, hammer on. Uh, Make daylight and then bring it all the way around. Alan's Greg and Hammer wondering where you heard it. Alright, so now get that back all squared up. And a lot of people, when you're making a bar shoe, a lot of people really, really stress about the shape of their bar shoe before they get it welded. And the one thing I can assure you is a bar shoe that's welded is easier to shape than a bar shoe that's not welded. And I'm just basically like if I was scarfing it. If I was scarfing it, I mean not what scarfing it, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, welding it. I'm getting everything nice and tight. So now, can they see that? Does that show up? A nice tight scarf. And then I've got my magic flux, which is nothing. It's just, this is the, the swan. And it the, the stuff, as soon as humidity hits it, it wrecks it, so it turns into a paste. You can see it's just a paste. And so what I'll do 
is I'll just put a little bit of the paste on there. And what you need to do is here's the secret to welding in a gas forge. Everybody's like, what is it? It is, you gotta let that paste turn, it, it's gonna melt and then it's gonna turn watery. As soon as it turns watery, it's ready to weld. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put paste on one side, I'll put paste on the other, but you don't wanna put your wire on there until you got water running on both sides. All right, you can see it's not even turned into a turned into liquid yet. So, and it's hard to show with the camera because the camera just dilates. But as soon as I get it to where it, it's good enough to stick on there, and it's not, it's now it's just drying out. Good. And I'm gonna go slow because I I know you guys would think it's funny if it falls all over the floor on TV. Brad Sinder says that's the price of admission right there. All right, so now I'm gonna put some more on this side. I put some more on this side, and now here's the secret: is I got a little staple of of uh, of aluminum, and I'm just gonna keep on flipping it until it gets hot enough. You can see, you can see the it's got liquid on there now. So now I just gotta get it. There we go. So now I, it's liquid, and I'll put my wire on there. Liquid. All right. There it goes. All right, I couldn't see. I'm gonna put it back in there. Just gotta wait, just, there it goes. Nope. You, but you just wanna pull it out before you have a mess. They heard a half, where's your eye defender? They're on my face. Wade. Gone. Wade. All right. You push. You can see the aluminum on the back side. Just go like this. Come over here real quick. You can see if you just quench it real quick. It cleans it up and now it's beautiful but it didn't weld I popped it off there we're just gonna go one more time but I didn't melt it oh. but it I'm just not I just don't want to burn it and put it in the end because everybody's talking about how how they've been just melting it it's all clean right now I've got a good scarf I got everything clean you can see it's nice and tidy so all I'm gonna do is put some more flux on there and, and redo the same situation Somebody asked what kind of wire do you use? This is part of a kit. And it's, it, I don't know what kind of wire you use, to be honest with you. It's part of the, at Anvil brand, they, they sell Alley Flux. And uh, it's, it's a kit that Swan Ford sells. It, it comes with the wire and the flux. You put the flux on there. Obviously, it's way easier in a, in a gas forge. But uh, you can do it in Coke Forge, because we have to do it in Coke Forge. We have 74 viewers, and we've only been 20 minutes in. Well, we're probably going to be four hours in if I don't learn how to weld this a little bit better. And I just about am out of good stuff, out of paste and stuff. And uh, Nicholas Starr says it's made out of unicorn hair? Yes. <laughs> and Steve uh, Wardhall said, did Hellgraph get cigarettes? No, uh, she's a... Uh, She's 
Alright. Again. Oh, no, you're awesome. You love you. Alright, so now what all we're doing is we're getting it to turn into a paste. And I'm getting below the fire because I couldn't see earlier. There we go. We got it turned into a liquid. Bruce Edwards says you can get the alley flex floor rod makes it a bit easier to flex on the inside of the rod. Tricky shift though. Bruce Edwards? There it went. Rice Edwards. That is the tricky shit right there. There we go. I got it that time. Then Tom yes, that Jonas. Nice welding, Craig. Don't quit your day job. This is my day job. <laughs> All right. A fine wire brush is usually the best for aluminum because you can do less damage just to see if you got it. There we go. Oh, yes. So, now you just go quick. Just... And that pops everything off, lets you take a good look at it, and we're set. We're set. Joe Nigren says, Craig, do you have sand in your side glass or is it just coke dust? It's just coke dust and sand. When you start out, you have to use sand, and then you just put sand in there. I mean, the coke dust fills in, it soaks in. All right. Jason Cher says this is really cool being live. Thank you, Jason. All right. We have... I don't know if that helps you or not. But it helps a bunch to rotate it, turn it to liquid, and then when you get to critical mat, where you think you're pretty close, put your wire on then. Otherwise, your wire is hotter than your aluminum and it rolls to the bottom and makes a puddle underneath. So you want it to go, and you want the, you want the seam to be hot enough to suck it in, because it does suck it in. All right, so, there we go. I don't know if that helps Robert, but that was my attempt at it. All right. Uh, Kyle Kandinsky, yep, thanks Craig, great idea. So what we got is we're just gonna, the easiest way to learn to bump it's the hardest thing to bump, but the easiest thing to learn to bump is a piece of half by one. It's really, really a nice section. It doesn't warp on you. If you're gonna learn to bump quarter by one or quarter by three quarter, you're gonna have a lot of grief. So get you a nice 11 inch piece of half by one, and then we'll go through tong position and everything on the bumping. Philip Fox says good stuff, Craig, and Jimmy Gore says thanks. So, so now, here's the thing, here, here, you have to have confidence to hit something, so you have to have your target there. If you're all over the place and you're loose, you don't have a target, so it's, it, I don't know how we do it, this is one of those things that doesn't go into your vocabulary. But you have to squeeze your tongs tight enough to have a good grip. But then you have to be limber enough to where you don't bend your stock. Because what people do is it's just like a motorcycle. They just rear down on it and they do more bending on their stock with their hand than they do with actually bumping it. So Jim Ferry says hi. Jim! What it's gotta be they gotta be it well into the cocktails by now. So, and then Jason Scher says, who's filming? Great job. All right. So, here's the thing that I learned from Derek Gardner. I'm sure Derek Gardner learned it from somebody else. You do not want to go with a sharp quench when you bump. When you have a sharp quench when you bump, it upsets right there. So, what you want to do is if you don't get your bump in the center on the coke fire, you want to put it in the fire where you do get it in the center. But if you don't get it in the center, the best thing you can do is take it out real quick and redirect your quench 
and stick it back in there and then now your heat will gravitate towards where you want to bump it because you want a tapered heat it'll bump best if the heat it goes from gradually black to gradually white hot but if you have a cold quench you get a nasty old knob right there and it doesn't bump exactly in the center Ben Lamos I think that's Lamos Lamos does that make a lot of sense Exactly. All right. So, so now we're gonna just stick it back in. You always want to just stick it back in. Obviously, it's gonna get hotter where you have your heat, and this will help a nice tapered bump instead of just having cold starts and stops where you quenched it down. But if, you, if you're fighting time because time's an issue, then obviously you don't want to do that. Dan, trees back. All right, see, the now you can see the nice, I'm holding it like this. The reason I'm barely holding it above the face of the anvil is because if I push down on the anvil, I torque it. So, and you straighten long ways. Always straighten long ways on the, more, the more material you got on the face, the faster you can straighten it. And it's not how hard you can hit it, it's how direct you can hit it. You want to have a contest in your own little brain saying, can I get eight licks in before I have to go to straightening it? So, you just need a hundred people watching. All right. All right, again. So now, think about this. You have four corners on the bottom of your bar stock. You have four corners on the top. If you think that it's bowing this way, you can hold that corner and this corner and shoot it towards you. So it's going that way. See how it shot that in? If you don't have it flat on the face of the anvil, these are going to direct. These are going to try and find flat with your hammer and find flat with the anvil. So if you are a short person and you do this, you have to get away from it. And when I say get away from it, the further you can move it away from you, the bigger the radius you can make. So, um, quad lineman CF, round side or flat side when you uh, bump? You can do the round side, and that helps you with this. It makes the me a mess out of the end of your bar stock. And then, um, Russ Goudet said, hey, yeah, Craig, you get He's a Canadian. He's the he is the Canadian version of Forged in Fire. That dude, that dude wakes up every morning. Oh and yeah, I'm down. Excellent. I'm out here cooking my maple syrup, eh? Um, no, no, no. That's Stuart Bruce. Oh, Stuart Bruce sorry, that. That, sorry. That's not but he asked, "Hey, Craig, is this video Trump to prove you're Canadian, Gus? You're building the wall to keep us out right yeah. now. Don't be asking yeah. crap like that." All right, so. Well, all right, so this is going to be a good deal because when you have a bump toe, you don't get any of the focus of your bump, your your radius in the toe. It goes out to the branches where it's weaker. So when you bump something, your toe tends to be flat and it makes more radius out in the branches. So what we're going to do is focus. This is a good this is a good drill to make a tight toe because you're making a hind shoe. This is a roadster toe, and you're going to try and direct and focus your your uh your your toe bend on the center so that's how we're going to accomplish this so aaron Sristed, hi guys when bumping do you have a medial heel up or lateral heel always medial or always medial if you if you have a preference like whenever i bump when i make pairs of shoes i make the ladder why wouldn't you you're going to put a little bit of material in the bump whenever you're when you're smacking the crap out of the heel but it bumps more on the side that you're bumping, so if you if you don't flip it around, your bump 
will stay on your side. So you got to keep an eye. You got to look at it and visually see where it's getting thicker and the majority of your, your material is going. Okay, so we have Wade something. I'm not even a tend Wade, to pronounce Wade, that. How do you Erler Dirksen. This is funny. This is like giving you hooked on fun. Erler Dirksen. Uh, um, <laughs> hold on. We're going to. I'm going to use my toe bend. All right. So. Erler Dirksen. That's a tough one. Yeah. All right. It's going to want to bend here and here. So I'm going to focus just right in the toe. See how I keep on repositioning my tongs. You'll see I, whenever they go up like this, I keep on getting them down like this. So now. All right, start here and push right up to the toe. Now, tighten the toe. Stuart Bruce says we're making, missing the hockey game, boys. Bruce, we're in New Mexico. We don't even know what rain is, much less ice. As damn what bony. you say you speak a hockey? All right. Very important. If I just run my toe up on the horn, it'll just squish out material. So you can make a, a, a section, a rectangle wider, and then you can run it up on the horn and you don't grow as much. So as long as you flatten before you sweeten, you always, you always conserve your length. This is about forging, not sports, all right? So, again, you can see my toe right here. I'm gonna set my toe up. And here, now we're gonna drift right into fullering. Bob Marshall, Bob Marshall calls these, and I, I agree. You have to set yourself on a hind shoe that's fullered. You make training wheels, which is you make a lump where your fullering starts. But what happens is that keeps everything from getting racked. If you just have a long oval, it's easy to get the shoe like this or like that. But if you have two points that you center your focus of where your fullering is and how you keep your toe square, you can make the shoe and then we can show how you can take that out at the very end. But you don't ever take it out if you're gonna set your shoe up to be set back a little off the toe. All right, we got a piece of three eighths, three quarter, and we'll just bump it up real quick. And do, we'll, we'll bump it up for fullering. Carlos, we agree this is the Facebook Live is the best thing so far. Thank you for watching. All right, here's a, here's a secret with fullering. Just pretend that the center of the reins, can you see that, Chris, does that work? The fullering, the reins, that represents the crease. So like, if you don't drag your fuller, what happens if you, you the fuller will stay in that crease. It's easy to keep it in that crease and you can hit it and you can do everything. But you can drag it through that crease where the handle drags through like that. And that'll open your shoe as you go. And you can drag it through like this and it'll wrap your heel around and close your shoe as you go. So whenever you have that little lump at the end of your fuller and that it always has the bubble, people, what you need to do is remember that if I take and I twist my creaser like this in the crease and I hit it hard when it's ice cold, if I smack it hard, 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 it's gonna leave it's gonna leave a, a, a notch here and a notch there where it binds. So what people have mistaken over the time is people think that you pick your fuller up when you get to the end of the crease and that keeps a square end. And it doesn't. What you do is you twist your fuller in there at the very end and then that way it pushes that lump to the inside. Well what that automatically does is when you bind it and you push with your fuller, it picks up out of there and it looks like you're tipping it forward to grab a square end. And really, 
what you do is if you see guys that really know how to fuller with a dead stop, they bind it in there. And as soon as they bind it in there, it picks up and comes out of the fuller. So that's something to keep in mind when you get to the end of the dead stop. And that's why it's easy to fuller when the handle. So when I have the dead stop that's coming around, and this is my dead stop, the side with the handle is always your strong side. Because when you come around and you have the dead stop on this side, you have to push and bind. And so it'd be nicer if the handle was on this side for this side over here. But there's always a weak side and a good side. Jim Poor and Jim Quick and Shane, they always say that there's the right way and the wrong way. And the best way to learn how to fuller is someone who's taken the time to teach you how to fuller. So um, Wade Olrickson is pronounced Old Rickson. Old Rick son. Son. And then Russ Cadet is shooing a cadaver leg in the future? Well, yeah. yeah, you know, but Russ, we don't really have to kill the horses we shoot, so we don't have that many cadaver legs around. I don't know, you guys probably got them every third horse, you know, you probably got a set of four dead legs. But Aren't you used to seeing your own work on there, though? What's that? Nothing. I didn't All say right. anything. <laughs> so quick, a bump. Here's a bump. And I, it's... I got it pretty well in the center. You can see I got it in the center, it drifts in. When you're first starting, lots of bumps. And as it cools down, you can hit it harder. The toe sets up everything. And if you're gonna make handmade shoes, you might as well bump the toe so you can get a reset. So uh, Colin Ford says, how about making a shoe for an asymmetric foot or a very straight walled foot? I said a word with more than three syllables. I'm getting a gold star today. Yeah. All right. So well, right now we're sticking with the game plan, and the game plan is we're going to show the idiosyncrasies of Fuller. And um, we'll get to that the asymmetric someday, foot next time. Someday. Someday. If we're not taking off Facebook by then. Look at look look at where my tongs are and how they're positioned. Look where I am on the horn. I'm going to start away from me. Take a look. So now you can see, if I just hit here, it'll whip the, the inertia will whip the heel up. So, can you see how I never hit on the horn with my hammer? Now I'll just flatten her up nice. And I'm getting my whip. All right, so I'm going to take my fuller. And I'll mark my fuller in. All right, so now if we get a shot on with straight on the horn, like straight. Okay, this is what, you take your fuller and can, can you see the fullering mark? We'll wait until it cools down a little bit. Um, so, Chris Deal, CJF, AWCF, why would a mother give their son that name? Why toe bend over the horn versus over right. the So now I'm going to pull. I'm going to pull and I'm going to show off my fullering and I'm going to set the inside. I'm not going to so much set the outside. And I never pinched my toe. I got to where my toe was right there. You can't see this side, obvious, but it's just the. You can see where I've made a line and I started the hemming to my fullering. Now we'll just set up, we'll just get it hot real quick. All right, hemming. The hardest part 
if you're gonna ham, it's easy to ham in the straight because you already see you're starting with a beautiful section and it sits up there all by itself. The second you distort it, it tends to fall forward or backwards. When you ham and narrow and sweeten on the horn, it's very important to know to stay perpendicular to the horn all the time. If you, if you cock it, that twists the whole top of your top section to one side or the other. So everybody focuses on where they're hitting and they lose sight of where they're hemming. And so all of a sudden they, they tilt their stock one way or the other and that's what wrecks the section and makes it all distorted. So, real quick, Joel Armstrong is apparently teaching someone on here about something about uh, about always having one good stop and one sloppy one in our flooring. Yeah, we already talked about that, Joel. You're the dude who comes into a movie after it's three quarters of the way over, and then Carlos, and you ask who the bad guy is. Who's the bad guy? Well, sit your ass down and watch. Alright, uh, Jason Shammer, is that a Justin Hammer? No, it's a catastrophic. Alright, when you hit the corner of a piece of bar stock, you have, the, you have the ability to do one thing, push it towards the floor or push it back in. We want to push it up and back in. So the first hit is up and back in. Then we're going to follow that edge down. Now we're going to, we got the same option with this corner. This corner can go down or go back up in, and we're gonna go back up in, and follow it down. The same thing, over and over, but once you got the corner knocked over, you don't have to revisit way back up here, you can go all the way down to the center right away. All right, I'm gonna straighten it up the best I can. Right here, we're just gonna, we're gonna, so I don't get any bro hacks on the inside edge of my fullerin. I'm gonna sit here and I'm gonna sweeten that up. That gets me off the face of the anvil. And then I'm gonna sweeten it up the rest of the way down. You don't wanna hem this far down because your hemming, your fullering comes out, so it's not displacing material as much. And then all I'm doing right here is straightening things up and making it true. All right. If you you can use a 3 8 wrench, you can use anything. But there's no point, there's no foul in just taking some calipers. Let me just open them up a little bit. And just scribe in a line. And then follow that line. And it doesn't even have to be where you want it to be. I could say, well, that line looks a little coarse. So then I'll go on the outside of that line. But at least now I have a parallel. I have a parallel between the outside edge, my scribed line, and my inside edge. Because if you fit feet properly, you need to be just as coarse or coarser in your heel nail as in your toenail. Because in your heel nail, you're going to fit with a little bit of width. In your toenail, you're not going to fit with any width unless you like to fit with uh, leverage. Strong said Tom Daly. Tom Daly needs to get spun out here. And Donald Rodrigo, the young Rodrigo, the slow flush. We are three admirers from the Dominican Republic and two from Venezuela watching on the car. That is way cool. Thank you for watching. And these that I just am hitting things a little bit colder than I would normally because you can't see them on the. All right. So again. If you were to take my fuller, and if I were to bind it in there this way, I would put a mark back here and a mark on the up there. So when I, this, actually the strength of the fuller and back here pushes the corner in to where you don't have a lump right where your fuller and ends. Justin Frank asks, are you knocking up the full width or more to the ground surface on the hem? You know, that's a good question, Justin, and, and what we're doing is, is I was up at Roy Bloom's, and Roy, that stuff like that bugs Roy. It's like, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. So I, I have gone back to just kind of condensing the whole material with a little bit of favoritism to the top edge or to the ground surface edge. Leaning it a bunch, I tell you what, 
you have to, when you lean it a bunch, you have to be pretty handy. People, people that are really good at fullering, like Shane Carter and Austin, uh, they, they can, they can, they can manipulate their hemming. But uh, when you first start out, try and keep your project as square as possible. So, there's, there's plenty of heat. What, what you want to do is, we'll just, we're going to just talk about this one heat. And, and the reason that these things can get so long and drawn out, we could talk about a million things, but these are just food for thought. Is we'll, we'll hem it and put it in there and just talk about what we're doing. Because everybody's like, I want to know how to hem. I want to know how to fuller. I want to know what, how to dress my fuller. And to be honest, it's all in your hands. It's just when things get to be uh, too nasty, they don't work right, you just have to keep after it and keep doing it because all the advice on Facebook's not going to replace actually working at your anvil. Rusky Dad says, when pulling in the toe, do you aim the puller at the center mark? No, no, you keep, you always keep. What you do is you keep your puller parallel to the branch, and that's hard enough as it is. Because you can pull that thing through your puller and crook it, and it changes. It actually makes a wider trough than the actual physical mass of your puller and when you don't stay straight in there. All right, so two things I do when it's really hot, just a free time to really doll up my, my heel, because i got all the time in the world when why not do that. All right. Keep it above parallel to the ground. Look at my tongs. They're in the toe and they're pointed towards the floor. And I'm gonna above parallel to the, and push my, and see, I, I grabbed another, when I hit here, I've got another grip with my tongs. I'm over the top. Now what I'll do, is I'm just gonna clean up this line here, be behind the widest part of the foot, go over the top, and finish on out. Now, Chris, if you want to come over here. All right. What we're going to do is people think I'm picking this up when I do this. And this, I'm twisting this in. That's twisting in. Twisting in. Keep the tools, you gotta keep your tool cooled off. If you uh, are in hot steel, the tip of that fuller is such a minute piece of material compared to the damage that you're pushing upon it right now. Every time I'm twisting. When you twist, look, just the twisting action makes it look like I'm picking up on it. You start off straight, and if you're poor, you can lean your fuller a little bit to push the fuller out, but this wrecks your section of stock even more. That be best to stay straight up and down. And like right now, you can see that what I've kept from doing is I've kept from dipping in. And so people don't get that lump right here, they dip in right here. So what, if you look, I'm parallel on my section. Now, what I'll do is whenever I drive my head stamp in there, I'll drive it just like I'm driving a nail. I'll pitch my head stamp the exact same way I would pitch my nails to accommodate the bottom of a horse's foot. And that, my friend, is what makes handmaids very, very nice to nail on. All right, real quick. We're gonna go into all of it. And you know what, people, this is such an awesome deal that we're not the only ones that are gonna do this. Everybody's gonna start doing this. And you're gonna have, you're gonna have tons and tons of people come out and, uh, and start doing videos. All right, a fuller. The way you sharpen a fuller 
is the blade should be hollow ground until it comes straight. You want it to be straight with the eye. And what happens is when people booger the end of their fullers, they clean the end of their fuller. And the only time that you should doctor on this side over here this is when you go from the widest point. Because when you sharpen a knife, you polish it till it's razor sharp. But when you put an edge on a knife, you start from the spine and you clean up towards the cutting edge. That's what you do with a fuller. When people who have fullers that are, they keep on getting further and further and further scrunched over. And then what they do is they push material down and out and they make a trough. Whenever you want a doctor on a fuller, you definitely want to go from the widest part, the spine, and you want to clean down to the tip. And then that way, you've got a nice straight cutting point and it goes into the material. And obviously, the width of this mass right here is going to dictate whether you have an E10 or an E12 or an E3 or a JC Ott. It all comes down to the width. What, what Jason Shearer said, I think that's what the guy's name is, right? Mm -hmm. If you lean your fuller, like this is, Shane Carter could probably use one fuller for everything he does because he's a master at leaning his fuller, keeping it straight up, and he has such good hammer control that he can hem something back up and not even have to blow it back out. And so it actually gives the appearance that it was done with a, no, a narrow fuller. Those are things that you do not want to try. Those are bad habits to get into until you know what you're doing. And so when people see that, that's what's, that's kind of the thing with, when you see Grant Moon do something, he's, a, he's an exceptional human being. And when you see Shane Carter or Jim Poor, they're exceptional human beings. So they, they kind of take a little bit of the clinic away from you because they don't show you the struggle. And so when you're dealing with basic fundamental things like this, best thing to do is keep things square. And so, I don't know, we're having fun. We, uh, we're not going to just do three-hour podcasts or whatever they want to call these things, but hit on some focal points. If you work on it, maybe the group can kind of move forward. And uh, you can, obviously, you can rewind these things and look at them again. So I uh, hope you guys have a good weekend. Enjoy this Veterans Weekend. And I uh, want to say thank you to all the veterans in the United States that gave all. And uh, some didn't give all, but they all gave something, and we really thank you. So thanks to the veterans. Peace out.